I think the most important point in starting an IVF process is in identifying the couple which needs IVF. Of course, the first category of couples who require IVF are the ones who have a problem. For example, the wife's tubes are blocked, husband's sperm quality is very poor, husband doesn't have any sperms, the age of the wife is on the higher side, uh, they have severe endometriosis, poor egg quality, all these factors tell a couple that they require an IVF to have a baby. The second category of couples are those that have genetic problems. Now, through IVF, through an embryo biopsy process, you can actually eliminate a lot of these genetic problems. For example, Down syndrome. For example, a lot of other hereditary problems like thalassemia. So these are again special couples who are going to require IVF. Third category of couples, of course, is a couple who's very desperate. They may not really require an IVF, but because of lack of time, husband stays in another country, visits his wife maybe for just a few weeks, for a few days, or they've really gone through the natural process for a very long time and they're really frustrated. There's a lot of social pressure on them. These are couples again, who may want to do an IVF out of their choice. Once we've identified a couple, before taking them onto the IVF process, is making them aware as to what to expect out of an IVF. Sometimes expectations run very high, thinking they, that, I will walk into the clinic, get an IVF done and walk out with the baby the very next month. Unfortunately, if this counseling has not happened before, expectations run high as I said, and when failures happen, people get devastated. Misunderstandings happen. So if all the figures are set right in the very beginning itself, what to expect in terms of physical problems, mental problems, costs, what to expect in terms of successes? Why do failures happen? How do we deal with failures? And if the patient is on the same page as the doctor, then the journey becomes much easier. Once we've identified the couple, we've also given them the expectations, then it is about preparing the couple. Preparing the couple mentally, physically and medically. And all three points are extremely important. Mentally, how do we prepare them? So this counseling itself becomes an important part of preparing them mentally as to what to expect, the good and the bad part of the IVF. We also have psychological counselors who talk to these couples about various baggages that they might be coming with, economical baggage, family baggage, social baggage, problems between husband and wife, having different expectations out of IVF. Sometimes blame games tend to happen. You know, it's only because of you that we are doing an IVF. Um, or we failed three cycles of IVF, the wife doesn't want to do it. So all these things are taken care of by the psychological counselor. Then preparing themselves physically. We always ask them to change their lifestyle. Lose weight if you can. If you can't, at least exercise. It heals you mentally, it heals you physically. It makes, it makes you stronger to deal with the whole challenges of an IVF. And of course, it's been shown conclusively that if your weight is on the lower side, if you're exercising, if you're healed from within, the IVF successes are also on the higher side. We try and put these patients also through a diet because a healthy diet can again improve your IVF successes. We use various things like meditation. It calms you down. It helps you deal with failures more. A simple thing like using acupuncture and meditation around the time of embryo transfer has been shown to improve the IVF successes. Medical preparation. We believe that you should never put a patient through an IVF the moment they come in. So say for example, the patient comes in, all investigations are clear, the patient is having her periods the next day. Should you put such a patient through an IVF? Never. Because when you build a house, each little small brick of the house becomes a building block. And you don't place one brick in the proper place your house is going to be weak and one day it's going to crumble. And then to go back and understand that which brick was weak is going to be an impossible task. We want to prepare them medically in the right way. So from the husband's side, there is a whole lot of investigations that we do, sperm tests that we do. We do something called a DNA fragmentation to understand the DNA damage in the sperms. From the wife's side, we again try and understand hormonally is she all right, thyroid, B12, vitamin D, as simple as a vitamin D deficiency can sometimes mess up the IVF success. There are other whole lot of parameters from the wife's side, 
which need to be looked into before we take them up for an IVF. They should be stopping smoking. It's very, very important. By smoking, I don't only mean cigarettes. Hookah and shisha are even worse than smoking. So that should be taken care of. Alcohol should be stopped for both the husband as well as the wife. Any recreational drugs which they might be taking absolutely is a no-no. So all this preparation uh, has to happen medically from, from their side as well. So we now have a couple who's prepared in every which way to go through the IVF process. Let's now discuss how the IVF actually happens. The first part of the IVF is synchronization. Now what is synchronization? Imagine you trying to herd um, a flock of sheep. Now, if your sheep is running in all different directions, it's going to be practically impossible for you to bring them all together. Which is why you have people running around the sheep all the time, trying to herd them together. So it's easier for you to take them all together in a certain direction. Same with the follicles. Now, the whole idea of giving injections during an IVF is to make a whole lot of eggs. But if the eggs are all different sizes, it will be very difficult for you to get a good number of eggs. So there comes the role of synchronization. There are certain therapies which are used before doing an IVF to make the follicles all come together of the same size. That improves our IVF success rates and the number of eggs that we get. Once the follicles are synchronized, the patient is now ready for stimulation. Now, what do you mean by stimulation? Normally, a woman would only mature one egg in any um, cycle or month if injections or medications were not given to her. However, there were many other eggs which were destined to become mature and big, but only because ovaries were not stimulated, which is why those eggs did not grow. In IVF, by giving a lot of injections, we take care of this problem, wherein a whole lot of eggs are stimulated. Why do we do that? Because we want to take out a lot of eggs so that we don't have to take out eggs again. And from those crop of eggs, we can make a lot of embryos and keep transferring those embryos one or two at a time so that pregnancies can be achieved not only the first time, but if the couple comes back a second time for a second pregnancy as well, through this crop of eggs and embryos itself, we can give them a second pregnancy also. So stimulation becomes very important. How do we stimulate? There are two protocols. One is a long protocol. One is a short protocol or an antagonist protocol. So. Injections are given, say, from the second day of periods every single day and this entire stimulation takes about 10 days of time after which the egg collection happens. Now, how do we know that the stimulation is going all right? Did I give the right dose? Should I have given more? Should I have given less? How is this dose decided? So the injection dose is decided based on the weight of the patient or what we call as a body mass index, age of the patient. The higher the age, the more the injection. Ovarian reserve. So there are tests that we do for ovarian reserve to understand what is the egg number that the patient actually has. The lesser the number of eggs, probably more the injections which would be required to stimulate the ovaries. So having done all that, we've decided on a particular type of injection, a particular dose of injection, and that started from day two. From there, monitoring happens by two methods. One, by doing regular ultrasounds. And we can actually see those follicles which are containing the egg. Eggs being microscopic, but the follicles being macroscopic which can be seen on ultrasound. So although we can't see the egg, we can actually see the follicles and they're growing slowly, bigger and bigger and bigger each day that we do an ultrasound. So that's one way. Secondly, we do certain blood tests. And as those blood values are going up, we're able to understand that those follicles will be growing and the eggs would also be growing within them. So this happens over a period of 10 days. After a point, we've understood that the follicles are ready. Probably the eggs inside are mature and it's now time to harvest those eggs. How is that done? An injection is given on a particular day once the follicles are ready. And about 36 hours later, the patient is put through an anesthesia. Why anesthesia? Because the procedure can be a little painful and we don't want the patient to have any pain. Once the patient is anesthetized, a vaginal ultrasound probe, the same ultrasound probe which has been used to do the ultrasound for this patient the last 10 days is now inserted in the vagina. 
A very fine needle is passed over this ultrasound probe into the ovary. That needle now sucks all the eggs that we've been seeing all this time, or rather the follicles that we've been seeing and the eggs that we've not been seeing. Those eggs are now sucked out of the ovary, collected into a test tube. The test tube now gets passed on to the embryologist. She pours this test tube containing fluid and the eggs into a dish and she starts to examine this under a microscope. And she says, okay, I found these many eggs and out of these many eggs that I found, these many are mature. The mature eggs are the ones that we can use for fertilization. So now once the eggs are collected, what does the embryologist do? The embryologist now has eggs in her hand. At the same time, the husband is giving a semen sample outside. Once the semen sample is also obtained, it's processed through a complex method in which the bad sperms are thrown away. The good sperms are taken and made much better, enriched, made more motile. They're running around faster at this point in time. So the best possible sperms are picked up. And here the embryologist on the other hand also has the mature eggs. From here, two processes of fertilization are undertaken. If the eggs are good, the sperms are good and there are no other negative factors available. The eggs and the sperms are put together into a dish and the sperms by themselves naturally fertilize the egg as they would do in a natural environment inside the fallopian tubes. The egg selects the right sperm and takes it inside. This is what is called as IVF or the classical in vitro fertilization. Unfortunately, because of certain reasons, the egg quality not being good or the sperm quality not being good, sometimes if you put them together, you'll realize they haven't fertilized and you've lost all the eggs. So the embryologist identifies certain situations from beforehand and says, no, this patient cannot undergo an IVF. This patient will undergo something called an ICSI or ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. What is this? Each egg is sucked by a vacuum and held under the microscope. Under huge amount of magnification, the embryologist will carefully select one sperm that the embryologist feels is the best or has put the sperm through certain processes to identify this best sperm. Now this sperm with a very fine needle is injected into the egg. Thus, we artificially create the process of fertilization under a microscope, wherein the egg by themselves or the sperm by itself does not have to fertilize. This having been done, this dish containing the egg and the sperm is now put into a very special environment which contains certain gases, humidity, temperature, all at a very controlled environment. And this is kept there for certain periods of time. Two days later, the embryologist will take this out and see how many of these eggs that we had placed into this incubator have fertilized. And then successively, it will be checked each day to see how these embryos, which are now eggs fertilized by the sperm, are growing and dividing into more and more cells. The highest form of development of an embryo outside the human body is called a blastocyst. A blastocyst is achieved five days after the eggs and at this point the embryo either needs to be frozen for future use or put back inside the body what we call as the embryo transfer. So we now have the embryos ready with us. As I said, two things can happen to these embryos. If the embryo transfer is not happening in the same cycle as the IVF egg collection, then it is going to be called as a frozen embryo transfer. If the embryo transfer is happening in the same cycle as in the month when the egg collection has been done, it's called a fresh embryo transfer. So if the embryo transfer is happening in another month, these embryos are going to be plunged into liquid nitrogen, of course, after having been treated them chemically, and the temperature goes down to as low as minus 196 degrees centigrade. These embryos can be put into the suspended animation, not just for one day, one month, one year, or maybe even for 10, 15, 20 years, after which they can be taken out at any point in time and used as if they were fresh. 
If this patient is going to undergo an embryo transfer in the fresh cycle, that is in the same cycle in which the egg collection was done, then say at the blastocyst stage, that means five days after the egg collection, the patient is brought back into the operation theater. The patient does not have to undergo an anesthesia. In a very simple method, of course under ultrasound guidance, we insert a very fine catheter through the vagina, through the mouth of the womb, into the uterus. And this is guided by the ultrasound to tell us exactly where to place the embryo. So that's my job. I place this outer catheter into the uterus. Then what the embryologist does is chooses one or two embryos under the microscope, which he or she deems fit for transfer. Then they load an inner catheter with these embryos and with certain other chemicals. That catheter is then brought from the embryology lab into the operation theater where I'm ready with my outer catheter for this inner catheter to come in. The embryologist then loads this inner catheter into the outer catheter, then through it, it goes inside the uterus and we drop the embryos there inside the uterus. As simple as that, the embryo transfer is done. There are a couple of myths that I definitely would want to break. There are millions of them. I think if I start breaking all the myths related to IVF, it would probably take a month's time. But most of the myths are uh, you know, around embryo transfer and what to do after an embryo transfer. I think the most important thing to do after an embryo transfer is be stress-free. You can actually be up and about the house. You don't have to undergo a bed rest, which is a very big myth that you have to probably lie down and stare at the ceiling, which is wrong. So we tell people that go back home, maybe just for a day, lie down in bed, read a book, watch a movie. From the second day itself, walk around the house as if nothing has happened. If you're a homemaker and you're happy being in the house, stay in the house over the next couple of days till the pregnancy results are due. If you're a working woman and it stresses you out to be at home more than being at work, and if you're going to be at work and not scream, not shout, not raise your blood pressure and not be stressed, then please go back to work. If that is your happy place to be, we want you to be happy over the next couple of days while you await your pregnancy test. You will feel funny things. Some people feel a flutter in their stomach. Some people even feel nauseous. Some people may even experience a bit of spotting. Some people may experience constipation. None of that is related or connected to your pregnancy being successful or being unsuccessful. So enjoy this time, meditate, read a book, watch a movie, listen to music, be happy and wait for those 9 to 11 days while we wait for the pregnancy miracle to happen. That in short is how IVF process happens to anyone.